Good morning and welcome to Leewood United Methodist Church. I'm Howard Johnson, pastor here. It's a joy to be gathered together to worship during this second week of Lent. It's hard to believe how much has changed outside, the, how the temperature has changed so dramatically. Perhaps we can experience that kind of drama in our own spiritual lives as well. We're glad you're here and we'd like to offer you some ways to stay connected with us. If you're interested in connecting with us just on a regular basis with our services and some of our other extras we put on YouTube, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can also uh, like us on Facebook as well. You may also be interested in receiving more information about some of the upcoming groups and activities that are happening in the life of the church, and you can do that by going to our website, logging on and, and requesting to be put on our weekly announcements list. I encourage you to do so. We love having you watching and being a part of the life of the church. Let us go for a moment and take a deep breath and have a word of prayer as we move into worship. God of grace, thank you for bringing us here. Thank you for this day. Thank you for all the blessings of our lives and we especially thank you for the opportunity to be in worship with you and with each other, even though we're not in the same place. Continue to shape us through this Lenten season so that as we move towards Easter, we begin to move from sorrow and separation and abandonment to the joy of resurrection and promise. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Pilgrims, we are invited to journey through this season of Lent towards the one who calls us each by a new name. Disciples, we walk with Jesus wherever he leads us, pulling our fears, our doubts, our longings behind us. Believers, we seek to trust the God who always surprises us, whose promises take on flesh and blood in the good news called Jesus. Good morning. As we begin our worship this morning, let us be reminded that from the beginning we have been a singing people. So I invite you to sing with joy our opening song this morning, We Are Called. The scripture reading today is from Genesis chapter 17 verses 1 through 7 and 15 through 16. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am El Shaddai. Walk with me and be trustworthy. I will make a covenant between us and I will give you many, many descendants. Abram fell on his face. And God said to him, But me, my covenant is with you. You will be the ancestor of many nations. And because I have made you the ancestor of many nations, your name will no longer be Abram, but Abraham. I will make you very fertile. I will produce nations from you, and kings will come from you. I will set up my covenant with you, and your descendants after you in every generation as an enduring covenant. I will be your God and your descendants God after you. God said to Abraham, As for your wife Sarai, you will no longer call her Sarai. Her name will now be Sarah. I will bless her and even give you a son from her. I will bless her so that she will become nation and kings of peoples will come from her. I will set my bow in the clouds, 
probably remember last week when Marcia reminded us about the covenant between God and Noah at the end of the flood. Do you remember that God promised Noah that never, ever, ever again would he destroy all the living things on earth with water? And then as a sign so that Noah and all of us could remember that covenant, God created rainbows. And so when we see rainbows, we always remember that promise. Well, today's story also has to do with a covenant between God and some people in the Bible. And this time, the sign that God give them, gives them has to do with names. Hmm, names can be pretty interesting. My name, for example, well, it's not very interesting, but it's when I was born, it was Anne Elizabeth Beadle. My mom liked the name Anne because it was just a nice, simple, plain name. And I had the last name Beetle because that was the last name of my father and my mother. Hmm. Then I married Wayne and I became Ann Beetle Bird. I took Wayne's last name and made that my new last name. And a lot of people do that when they get married. The woman will take the name of the husband for her new name. Not everybody, but many people. Well, sometimes names can be fun. I have two friends, one is named Valley, and one is named Valerie, and I bet you can guess why they have those names. That's right, they were both born on Valentine's Day. Hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, sometimes names can be given to honor or to remember people. My older brother, for example, is Robert Sheldon Beadle. Well, Sheldon was the first name of our grandfather. So my brother Bob, Robert, was named in honor of our grandfather. Then my younger brother is David Armstrong Beadle. Armstrong was my mother's last name before she married my father. So Armstrong honors my mother's family. Hmm. You might want to ask your parents about your name and how they decided what it would be and what kind of meaning it has for them. Well, today's story of God's covenant is about a very, very old married couple, Abram and Sarai. Now, Abram and Sarai were never able to have children, and that was very heartbreaking for them. It made them terribly sad. Even though they were super old, way beyond when people usually have children, God told Abram that he would be the father of many, many nations. And God promised his covenant with Abram was that God would be the father of all the people born into Abram's family well into the future. As a sign of that promise, God changed Abram's name. So Abram became Abraham. Well, then God made a promise to Abraham's wife, Sarai. And he said to her, you are going to have a son, and you're going to name him Isaac. And as a sign of this promise that you're going to have a son, your name is going to change also. You will no longer be Sarai, you will be Sarah. So God changed Abram's name to Abraham and Sarai's name to Sarah as a sign that their son Isaac would become the father of many, many, many more people. God told Abraham that those descendants would be as numerous as the stars in the sky and the grains of sand on the seashore. Have you ever tried to count all the stars in the sky? Or, harder yet, all of the grains of sand that there are? That would be pretty tough. But let's just look at something that sort of helps us visualize what we're talking about is the number of people. 
So we have some reminders here. Let's see, We have got some grains of sand and you might notice those grains of sand are not all the same. Those grains of sand are like all the descendants, all the people of Abraham and Sarah's family. So we're going to take those grains of sand and we're going to pour some of them into this bottle. Okay, that's the sand on our seashore. Now, right above that seashore, we have sky, correct? So we've got some blue water, which we're also going to add. And we're going to pretend that that is the sky. So now we have the many, many grains of sand. And we have the sky above it. Now, God also talked about the stars in the sky, didn't he? So why don't we take some of this gold glitter, and we're going to sprinkle that in to represent the stars in the sky. And it might be a good idea to put a lid on this bottle, and we're going to shake that up a little bit so those stars can shine, shine, shine in the sky. And let's see if you can see those. There they go. You see that glitter shining about? Just like it would be nearly impossible to count the grains of sand or all the stars in the sky, we can't even begin to count all of the members of Abraham's family. But we know the Father Abraham song, right? Father Abraham had many sons, and I am one of them, and so are you. And that song tells us that we are all part of the family going way back to Abraham. And even though the names that we use every day are different one from another, we all share one common name, child of God. Each one of us is a child of God going way back to the time of Abraham and Sarah and Isaac. All of us, everybody around us, is part of God's family. Pretty nice. Let's pray together. Dear God, each of us is very, very different. You made us so unique. We have many different names. Yet, through your covenants with Abraham and Sarah, you made each of us also alike for we are all your children. Help us to look at everyone as one of your blessed children of God, because they are. And all the people said, Amen. Would you join me now in a word of prayer? Though people may turn their backs on us, God, you do not hide your face from us. Though others may try to take away our hope, you assure us of the future waiting for us. You speak your name, Creator, and it is enough. When we try to dictate our fears to you, you invite us to follow you into self-denial and service. As we struggle to shape our lifestyle to yours, you carry us with, where, with you wherever we go. You speak your good news, teacher of open hearts, and it is enough. Though we have done nothing to earn them, you pour out the gifts of grace and mercy upon us. When we stumble over our lack of trust, you set us back on our feet to follow you into the kingdom. You speak your peace, breath of holiness, and it is enough. God in community, holy in one, it is enough that you hear us even now as we pray. 
Amen. Father, who art in heaven. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. As we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 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 Hear these words from Psalm 22, verses 23 through 31. All of you who revere the Lord, praise him. All of you who are Jacob's descendants, honor him. All of you who are all Israel's offspring, stand in awe of him because he didn't despise or detest the suffering of the one who suffered. He didn't hide his face from me. No, he listened when I cried out to him for help. I offer praise in the great congregation because of you. I will fulfill my promises in the presence of those who honor God. Let all those who are suffering eat and be full. Let all who seek the Lord praise him. I pray your hearts live forever. Every part of the earth will remember and come back to the Lord. Every fam family among all the nations will worship you. Because the right to rule belongs to the Lord, he rules all nations. Indeed, all the earth's powerful will worship him. All who are descending to the dust will kneel before him. My being also lives for him. Future descendants will serve him. Generations to come will be told about my Lord. They will pro proclaim God's righteousness to those not yet born, telling them what God has done. 
Earlier in the service, you heard the words read from Genesis chapter 17. And I'll remind you of the first verse. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. In that chapter, God establishes a covenant with Abram and Sarai, who he then later renames Abraham and Sarah. And there's a lot of fun stuff that happens in that story. Uh, the promise that they will have heirs that are countless, like they're like the stars. And as we remember, they're a little bit uh, incredulous given their age, if that's even possible. In fact, Sarah even laughs. But God makes a covenant promise inviting them to live into that relationship by saying, walk before me and be blameless. When we hear that, the deeper question for us is, how do we walk before God in, in the name we have been given? How do we re represent that covenant promise for which we live and breathe and have our being? I think there is a way for us to hear and experience this walking before God life that we're called to. It involves being real with one another about the journey, about that walk. More importantly, it matters that we are real with God about our walk. Walk before me, says our God, and be blameless. I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty hard <laughs> to be blameless. But as we think about what God is asking of Abram and Sarai at that point, God is not seeking uh, perfection. God is seeking a purity of heart to walk before God. It's very similar, actually, to the, the phrasing we use from Wesleyan background here, and that is the question comes to all of, Wesley used to ask this question of all his preachers and leaders in the church. He'd say, are you going on to perfection in love? He didn't say, are you going on to perfection? You know, everything's going to be done perfectly. No. Are you going on to perfection in love? Are you growing to this higher possibility, this higher standard? I think that's a lot of the same tone that the conversation is happening with God and Abram and Sarai. As I was thinking about that question, are you going on to perfection in love? That's one of those questions we still, every year at annual conference when we um, ordain pastors, they're asked that same question. They're asked a, a number of traditional Wesleyan questions. But that's one of them. Are you going on to perfection in love? And it's a hard question to answer. It's not always easy. But this season of Lent that we ponder, as we think about it what, it, what it looks like and feels like to walk before God and how we walk in the covenant promise that God has given, it seems that that story is probably not as similar to ours as are the words of Psalm 22. When you consider our COVID experience, that may actually more resemble what uh, we need to hear in that psalm. The psalm was likely written by David, who was a person who fully experienced the, both the spiritual highs of faith and relationship to God and of God's blessings, and also the feelings of total abandonment and fear that overcame him from time to time. Now, I read to you, starting with verse 23 of Psalm 22, I didn't read the entire psalm. The psalm begins with a crying out to God, a very personal cry that reflects a close and deep relationship that now seems completely broken. It's a cry of feeling of abandonment. And then first section through the 18, first 18 verses, really, it's a, it's a psalm of, that is a graphic description 
of hopelessness, of abandonment, of being set upon by evil. Bulls of Bashan surround him, the psalmist says. He's broken and he's poured out. His bones, very bones are broken and there's so much more suffering described. Surrounded by dogs and evil people casting lots for his garments. Then in verses 19 and 20, we hear once again the psalmist's plea for deliverance. One last request for God to enter in and save him. It's a recognition that God alone can save him. And the Christ begins to signal a turning point in the psalm. It is amazing and a lesson for us how the psalm demonstrates in that very act of crying out to God, one sorrow can be turned into joy. One's petition for aid can turn to confidence into celebrating God's presence. And it moves from one lament, deep, deep lament of their condition, to a celebration of praise and worship. We can hear both things in verse 21, which is a, a transition point in the, in the scripture. Save me from the mouth of the lion, from the horns of the wild oxen, you have answered me. And from that point on, we hear what I read earlier. This progressively celebratory understanding of who God is and the relationship with God in fulfilling God's promise. Now, in your life, in your journey of faith, if it's one of those that feels more like a roller coaster, this psalm may be for you. The basic structure of transformation experienced in the psalm appears in the structures of our own communities, prayer and piety. The movement from petition and supplication to praise and adoration provide the foundation of the service of word and table that we celebrate when we do communion. It's the pattern also of Lent and Easter. The whole experience of, of Lent in many ways is naming all the troubles we have of, of recognizing we're not necessarily the ones who can handle all this then crying out to God. Openly, honestly describing and walking before God to share what our lives are. And in the pattern of Lenten Easter, we hear the very passion of the Lord from humiliation to glorification. Indeed, the gospel writers saw the transformation of Psalm 22 realized and actualized in the death and resurrection of Jesus. On Good Friday, we will rehear these words from the Psalm on Good Friday as we often do during Passion Week. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Those are the starting words for Psalm 22. Psalm 22 it functions then as an ancient prayer that invites the God forsaken to utter the seemingly unutterable words of the destruction and sorrow and suffering that they face. That God is gone, has forsaken them. And to pray those words to God and then see what happens. The outcome is that the psalmist moves from isolation to integration in the community, from forsakenness to worship, and we are invited to do so as well. Jesus' choice of this exclamation from the beginning words of Psalm 22, spoken from the cross, reminds us, reminds all his hearers familiar with the passage and with the psalm, that they were not without hope ever. That God doesn't abandon us even in our darkest hour and it echoes the covenantal promise of God being present with us on our journey of faith, on our walk before God. God's invitation to Abraham to walk before me 
extends to us as well. To walk into whatever lies ahead, no matter how troubling, no matter how isolated or forsaken, towards redemption, integration, and worship. In the end, the message is quite simple. We are never alone. Amen.
Go now in the power that God gives you throughout your life. Go in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and go with the promise of the covenant that God made with Abraham and Sarah to be part of the heirs of God. Go in peace and grace and love and serve in Jesus' name. Amen.